One of the hardest things to do is to make a truly good sequel game. It's easy to make a bad or even a mediocre sequel. I mean, with all the pieces in place from the first game, you just gotta expand on it, right? Well, more often than not, that just leads to a bland and forgettable gaming experience. A good sequel needs a much more delicate touch. It needs certain things that'll help make it stand out and to make sure that it doesn't fall into the void just a month after release. Here's how I like to break it down. Number one, a sequel game needs to be accessible. This is the hardest step to achieve because it kind of contradicts the whole point of a sequel, but let me explain why it matters. A sequel needs to appeal to an audience, regardless of if they've played the first game or not. A game that's just aiming to be a sequel is typically littered with inside jokes and references, and while those aren't bad things in moderation, you can always tell a bad sequel when it's carried by the weight of its references. Just look at games like Duke Nukem Forever or Sonic 06, and trust me, that's not the only thing that's wrong with that Sonic game. But making a good sequel requires more tact. There's nothing wrong with references, so it's okay to have some but a game should strive to be its own thing before it even considers references. Let's look at a game like Borderlands 2, which actually was the first Borderlands game I ever played. The game is very smart in its setup. It opens with a story in reference to the first game, but it sets up a new game and it doesn't sit on retelling the story of the first game other than a few throwaway lines. That's what makes Borderlands 2 shine as a sequel. As a new player going in, and I know this from experience, I was never once worried about not understanding the plot of the first game, because in the grand scheme of the second, it doesn't matter. There are however some games where needing to know the first game's plot is kind of unavoidable, and that's where recaps come in. More and more recently, lots of games have been using recaps to fill in the story for players who have either forgotten or who just have never played the first game, and the best example I can think of that right now is Psychonauts 2. The intro to Psychonauts 2 recaps the plot of the first game, and more importantly, the plot of Psychonauts Rhombus of Ruin, a game overlooked by a lot because it's VR only. The thing about recaps though, is that they have to be really good, otherwise they risk just leaving the audience more confused than before. And that's a hard tightrope to walk, because you have to balance providing info with the retention of your audience, so if you go overboard with the details, the audience will just be confused. Or if you pander to the audience and don't provide enough detail, then the audience will also be confused. All in all, step one is the hardest part about making a sequel. But once it's achieved, more players will be less afraid to play a game just because it has the number two on it. Speaking of the number two. Number two. A sequel needs to improve upon the ideas of its predecessors. A sequel shouldn't just be a rehash of the first game. Ideas need to be updated, introducing new mechanics and gameplay elements, while also retaining some of the themes from the original. There are a lot of ways to do this well, and a lot of ways to do this poorly. Let's start by looking at Bioshock 2. Bioshock 2 is the lowest rated of the Bioshock games, and with good reason, honestly. It can't hold up to the legacy of the first game or the majesty of the third, and that's because of a few things. The game came out a few years after the first Bioshock, but it didn't really improve upon anything. It kept a lot of the same ideas and mechanics as the first game, and the content just felt derivative in a lot of ways. It kept the same location from the first game, but removed a lot of the horror elements in favor of a much more streamlined first-person shooter. In all honesty, the game was a step back from the game that came before it, and that's not to say that Bioshock 2 is a bad game, because it's really not, but it just doesn't quite hold up to what came before it or after it. There are some easy fixes though. To make Bioshock 2 a better game, it needs to grow into its own thing. It can't just hold on to the coattails of Bioshock, and that means adding new mechanics, improving upon the game's combat, which just feels pretty much the same as the first, and then giving back in some of those horror elements. Honestly, the story could use some fixing too, but that's not what this section is about. But with those small fixes made, the game could feel closer to the original while also feeling like something new. A sequel that executes these ideas perfectly is Batman Arkham City. Arkham City succeeds as a sequel on every front. It kept the tone and themes of the first game while adding in new abilities, new gameplay elements such as literally flying around the world map, something which the next game Arkham Knight pushed to the limit, and then adding in the ability to swap to other characters in combat. 
It took the stealth investigative gameplay to the next level, but didn't go too crazy with it, and that works perfectly for the game. It also has a nice change of scenery from the first game, but it still manages to keep the same style as Arkham Asylum. Arkham City gets a gold star as a sequel. It managed to be a continuation that holds on its own, while also improving and building off the blocks of the first game. But there's still one more thing that makes it great, which leads us to step three. Number three. A sequel should grow the universe. Now this doesn't apply to games that are sequels in name only, but a good sequel, in my sense, is about expansion. I talked about this a bit briefly in the last section, but Bioshock 2 didn't really grow the game's universe in terms of location. It did, however, expand on the lore of the universe, which also counts for this, so I'm gonna stop bullying that game now. But good sequels provide more context to the game's universe, which means new locations, new stories, and showing how those stories connect to the past games and the world at large. So let's take a look back at some of the games I talked about earlier, starting with Arkham City. Arkham Asylum took place in, you guessed it, Arkham Asylum. It was a relatively big location, but still enclosed enough to make the game feel more linear. Arkham City not only grew the map in size, it also grew the map in scale, with towering buildings like you might find in an actual city. It also connects into the shared universe of the games by giving you a relative location compared to where the first game takes place. So in that sense, it grew the world physically, but it also grew the world by adding in new villains and allies who all have their own lore which you can pick up on through the game. Going from a relatively straightforward Joker plot of the first game, there are 25 villains in Arkham City, including the DLC, and what's even more impressive is that they all fit naturally into the game's plot, so the story and the world feel so much bigger than the first game, and it still feels connected. There's another way that this growth can happen too though, so let's jump back to Borderlands 2. Borderlands 2 contains a lot of references and characters from the first game, but the thing I admire most is how it built upon the world of the first game. Pandora in Borderlands 1 is already huge, but Borderlands 2 makes it feel even bigger, and while there are tons of new locations in Borderlands 2, what really draws me in is when you get to revisit a few of the locations from the first game and see how they've changed since the first game's events. You can see the devastation that has been brought upon familiar locations by Hyperion slag mining operations, and you can learn how it all went down through side quests and echo logs, which is just an extremely fascinating way to view the world, and it really makes the game feel even more immersive. There are plenty of other small things that can be done to make a good sequel, but with those three main steps, you can save a sequel from feeling derivative or just all around bad. So take these notes, game devs. I promise I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, but as a consumer of your product, I tend to pick up on a lot of things, and this just happens to be one of them. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked what you saw, be sure to subscribe for more content just like this. I also do game reviews and other small video projects. Um, there should be some handy dandy links appearing on the screen around me right now. It's, it's easy to find more videos. They're, they're all right there. Okay, y'all. Peace out. Till next time, I will catch you on the flip side.